This is the second part of the lectures on education and social policy. So again, we're going to be going through two of the aims of education, uh, social policy and education and linking that to the individual policies to see whether or not they were successful. So just like last time, use your notes grids, use the video or the audio, depending on which one you've decided to use to um, take notes. But you're going to need to decide whether you think these policies were successful in achieving their aims or if they were perhaps less than successful and that maybe their latent functions were <clears throat> more impactful than their intended ones. So last lesson, we talked about um, raising standards and marketization policies. So we looked at how education policies were being used to make education better and also how to introduce how education policies have introduced um, concepts of business and um, competition to the education system. <coughs> Excuse me. This lesson we're going to be looking or this lecture we're going to be looking at how policies are trying to create educational equality and the four different types of equality that they're aiming for and also we'll be looking at how they try to create economic efficiency. So we're going to start with educational equality. And as I said, there are four types of education of equality for education. The first type is access. And this is the idea that all students should be able to access a good school regardless of their socioeconomic background. So it doesn't matter if you're working class, you're middle class, you're upper class, you should be able to have access to a good or better state education. Now, we're not talking about access to private education. The social policies only apply to state schools. But we need to look at the policies that have meant that students are able to access good quality schools regardless of their background. There's also equality of circumstance, which is stating that all students should start school at a similar level, regardless of their socioeconomic background. So there should be very little discrepancy between students when they actually start school. And that can link to reading and writing, social skills, fine motor skills, things like that. But it's about creating an equal starting point for all students. Equality of participation means that all students should be able to fully participate in all aspects of their education. They shouldn't be excluded from something due to their socioeconomic background or not being able to afford something or lack of resources. And finally, we'll be looking at equality of outcome. Now, here we're talking about students being able to have the same chances of academic achievement, regardless of socioeconomic background. We're not talking about everybody coming out with the same grades. We're talking about having the opportunity and the um, ability to get the best grade possible that they can. Now, not everyone is an A grade or a nine, grade nine student. I never got an A in my life. So we it's about giving them the chances and the opportunities to do the best that they can, not necessarily everybody getting the same. So when we're, what we're talking about here with the quality of education is we're talking about students all having the same opportunities and having the same chances of economic of academic success of having a chance to participate fully in their education as they grow up, starting from a same point and being able to attend a good school. Now, there is an argument that um, it shouldn't be equality of education. Everyone shouldn't be given the same. It should be equity of education. And what they mean by equity is everybody should be given what they need to succeed. So if you need more help, maybe you've got a special educational need, 
maybe you're from a deprived background and require some support with resources everybody should have what they need not just the bog standard okay now whether or not you agree or disagree with that is up to you but what the policies are trying to do is to create that level playing field so that idea that everybody gets the same when it comes to their education so so let's look at some of the policies that have been introduced in order to create this educational equality so the first one we're going to look at is the open enrollment which you'll remember was part of the 1988 education reform act and this policy um, made it so that parents could choose the best school for their child rather than being limited by their catchment area or um, geographical area and it wasn't just about giving parents more choice so the, the parentocracy element of marketization it was also making creating equality of access because it meant that parents were able to spend send their child to the best school for their child and it was and you didn't just send it to send your child to the local school because that just happened to be your local school now we've already talked about the covert selection processes and um, the ways that perhaps people don't necessarily have completely open enrollment but when it comes to equality of access we can also argue that it's not equality because you're it's almost a postcode lottery um, working class parents can't necessarily afford to move to areas where there are good schools and house prices around good schools tend to be much higher um, and that means that you you're still having that inequality there are better schools in more affluent areas and this could be linked back to the funding formula and things like that where these schools attract more students more students means more money more money means more resources so this idea that open enrollment created equality of access for students didn't really may not necessarily be true because your working class parents are still stuck with local schools perhaps because they can't afford to get their students or their children to um schools further away they may not be able to afford the public transport costs or they may not be able to afford um to to get them there um so whether or not we've got equality of access the open enrollment policy tried to create that but it's questionable as to whether or not it actually achieved it you then also got the introduction of the national curriculum and this could link to equality of outcome as well as um, equality of participation because the national curriculum created that baseline it created um, the minimum standard for education so it means that all students were receiving that minimum requirement and all students would be able to access that minimum requirement now again the problem with this is in terms of equality of participation the national curriculum is quite academic and if you're not an academic student you might struggle to access that curriculum and that again links into equality of outcome because if you can't access it you can't then achieve the best grade possible for you so although on the, again uh, as a purpose it does show equality of participation and equality of outcome it doesn't necessarily mean that it's achieved it because we don't all access the national curriculum in the same way and schools interpret the national curriculum in different ways now if we look at new labor one of the things they've introduced was the education action zones and we talked about this last time these were areas of deprivation where the government would uh, provide additional funding and access to resources and to teachers and experts to support education in that area and 
it was quite a considerable amount of money that they were they were pumping into these areas to raise achieve raise standards but at the same time this also created equality or links to equality of outcome so it, it was trying to level the playing field between those affluent schools who had funding and resources and things like that with schools that perhaps didn't have those facilities or those resources so it meant that those students had the same chances of academic achievement as those who were going to more affluent schools it was also talking about equality of uh, participation because it provided opportunities for students who perhaps couldn't afford certain things or um, schools who couldn't get the resources they need to get them so that that way all the students regardless of which school you went to were receiving the same educational opportunities um, they also introduced the EMA and this was the education maintenance allowance and this was aimed at post 16 and what it was was if you came from a poorer uh, background so this was means tested depending on how much par your parents earned you could qualify for the EMA which was at the time 30 pounds a week to pay directly to the student who was engaged in post 16 education so it could be sixth form it could be college it could be a levels BTEC, gmvqs didn't matter what qualification you were engaged in as long as you were engaged in post 16 education and if your attendance was good you got your ema if your achievement was good you got bonuses and you got given a little bit more cash and the idea behind this was to create equality of participation so it, it was a way of helping students who perhaps wouldn't have gone to um, sixth form or on to further education because they the, the families needed them to go and get a job now bear in mind that this was a time when you left school at 16 compulsory education ended at 16 it's only been the last few years where it's been you have to be in educational training until you're 18 um, so the EMA was a way to encourage those from poorer or more, de more deprived backgrounds to stay on in education and get more qualifications which could then lead to higher jobs uh, higher paid jobs and um, break that cycle of poverty so it was uh, you would get 30 pounds a week and it would be paid directly to the student so it wasn't like it was going to the parents it wasn't going to the colleges or the schools it was going directly to the students to help so that they could engage in um, post-16 education so it, it was creating that equality of participation and equality of access as well because what we're taught what we're seeing here is that at the time post-16 education was kind of a middle upper working class upper uh, lower middle class and middle class um, venture because students could afford to stay on an education in lower working class families they couldn't they were required to go and get a full-time job to support help support family to support themselves and so in one respect you can see yes that's that's a great idea however problem with the EMA was it was expensive and it didn't last for very long um, it was introduced in the early 2000s um, I know this because it was introduced it was actually introduced in September 2000 and I know this because that was the year I left sixth form education so I wouldn't have qualified for it um, I, well I wouldn't have uh, been able to apply for it um, and it didn't last very long because it was quite expensive and it required a lot from schools in terms of um, attendance which in a school isn't so bad but with six form colleges it was something that was a little bit harder uh, it wasn't something that they were used to doing so it was hard to monitor but it did do it did encourage more students to or more children more, more post uh, 16 year olds to stay on in education they also introduced sure start programs and you may have heard of these um, around and they do kind of still exist 
but they've been so defunded that many of them now have closed. And this was again about um, equality of circumstance. And it was a preschool type program where um, children would receive free preschool places, um, nursery type places, and they would be given, they would be reading, writing, basic motor, uh, fine neuro, motor neuron skills. It was a play group type thing, and it, but it was also parental support for um, parents. And every child was entitled to a certain amount of hours. And then you could top that up by paying for additional hours if you wanted to. Um, and it was relatively cheap. Nursery places are not cheap. Um, they can range anything from £30 for half a day to over £70 for half a day. And they are charged per half day, not by full day. And um, so the Sure Start programme kind of gave preschool opportunities to those who perhaps wouldn't have had them previously um, and it meant that children were able to start school with a better level of social skills motor neuron skills basic reading and writing possibly or hold like holding a pencil type thing which gave them an equal, more equal start to their educational pro, um, process. The coalition government introduced pupil premium and this was to cre create equality of participation. And we've talked about pupil premium before. It's that additional funding for children from deprived areas uh, or from deprived backgrounds or from um, military families, whether they're looked after or not looked after or previously looked after children, they were all it would qualify for pupil premium. And it's an amount, certain amount of money and it varies year on year, depending on the government budget, which is paid to the school to support that child, those children's education, providing um, resources, revision guides, stationery, uniform, um, trips, things like that, which would just help them to participate more fully in the education programme. Now, as I said before, it wasn't a set amount per child. It's a central pot that you, teachers would go to whoever was in charge of pupil premium and say, I'd like to buy this student um, some revision guides from the pupil premium funds. Pupil premium coordinator would kind of go yes or no. And that's how it would work. Now, um, the problem with this is, yes, it does create um, equality of participation, but it depends on who's in charge of your of that budget as to whether or not they decide you can have the funds for that child or not. So there was some elements of corruption and misappropriation of funds. These funds were ring fenced and that means that they weren't supposed to be used for anything but supporting pupil premium. But with some interesting accounting, um, there, were, there have been cases of pupil premium money being used for things that are not meant for pupil premium. The formed exam structure. So again, we were talking about this in the last lecture. Michael Gove decided to go for the linear exams because he felt that it was unfair. So again, this is equality of outcome that some students were able to reset the, the same modules three or four times to get the best grade. And because schools only pay for you to be entered once, unless there is extenuating circumstances, it, re it meant that the lower um, working class, the working class students wouldn't necessarily be able to afford to pay for those resets. So they would be stuck with the first grade that they got rather than being able to retry and do it again and again just to see if they could get better grades. So this kind of links into the equality of outcome and it gives everybody the same chance at achieving the best grade possible. Now we know that exams, linear exams and exams aren't exactly the most equitable in terms of outcomes. Some people do well in exams, some people don't do well in exams. Things can happen that can mean that you're not perhaps at your best on the day of the exam. 
But by taking away that opportunity to reset and reset and reset, it has meant that um, there is more equality of outcome. The Conservatives introduced a new policy called T levels, and this was kind of in terms of both equality of outcome and equality of participation. They, they accepted that um, not every student is academic, not everyone's going to do well at um, A level or GCSE, and the T levels were more vocational qualifications. So instead of doing GCSE, um, history for example you might do a more vocational qualification a T level and this was introduced um, in 2017 um, not with huge fanfare but not really much substance but the idea was that it gave those who were perhaps a little bit less academic a bit more of a chance to achieve educational success and get qualifications that could lead on to jobs however people don't really understand the t, t levels so we don't really know how they work employers don't really understand them either so it's although it is creating equality of outcome in terms of giving students the chance for educational success once you've left school it can then become a little bit problematic but we haven't really seen any students having gone through the whole process yet because of covid they also introduced 100% funding for apprenticeships for 16 to 18 year olds. So as part of after getting rid of the EMA, when the coalition was um, in government, that's when they introduced the idea that you had to be in some form of education or training until you were 18. Now, the idealistic side of that was that it wanted to make sure that student uh, children had the best educational opportunities possible. The cynical view of it is it was a way of manipulating unemployment figures, because if you're meant to be in education or training until you're 18, you can't be included on the unemployment figures. However, they haven't actually introduced any measures for those who aren't engaged in education or training until they're 18. So if you don't go to sixth form or you don't go to college, you don't do an apprenticeship, there's actually nothing that they're going to do. So it, it was more of a face um, policy rather than an actual in, in, enforceable one. But what they did introduce was 100% funding for apprenticeships for 16 to 18 year olds. So if you didn't want to go into um, A levels or a B tech or you didn't want to go back into college, you could apply for an apprenticeship. And 100% funding meant that the employer would be given basically your apprenticeship wage. So they're not out of pocket. And an apprenticeship would be say three days a week in employment, two days a week in college learning the theory behind the um, whatever it is you're doing. And apprenticeships could range in topic massively. Um, so they would range from car mechanics, hairdressing, nursing, to electrical engineering. Um, they and they were or they are you are able to use these apprenticeships to apply to university if you if you wanted to so they're, they're an alternative option again to create equality of outcome for those students who perhaps aren't don't want to take a, um, an academic route and they've also introduced um, more degree level apprenticeships where you spend you work for a company and they pay for you to go to university one maybe two days a week now because you're at university part-time it could mean that you take four or five years to complete your degree and then you probably have to play work for the company for a number of years afterwards but it's an alternative to a traditional um, degree it also means that with a degree level apprenticeship you're not only earning a wage but you're also not accruing accu accumulating any debt because everything is paid for by the the employer that you're you're working for. So again, it was these apprenticeships were creating equality of outcome, but also equality of participation, because it opened up higher and further education to students who perhaps 
wouldn't have thought to do them because they couldn't afford it or it wasn't something that was part of their future plans. So these policies were trying to do the best for the students, but whether or not they were successful, that's up to you to decide. So the final aim that we're going to look at is economic efficiency. Now, this isn't to do with money or with school budgets or anything like that. It's not about making them um, schools more economically viable. This is about creating a flexible and um, trained workforce to meet the needs of society by teaching essential skills. So this is about getting students ready for the workforce. Now you can imagine the Marxists would kind of go there, there you go, see our aim. We said that education was about um, getting people ready for the workforce, the correspondence principle. Um, they might not like it, but they, they would accept that that is um, a role that the education system plays. So this is really that kind of evidence to show the correspondence principle and about getting students ready for the world of work. So if we look at some of the policies, and I would say this is probably more of the minor um, aims of education policy. It's not something that they're really focused in on. So there are less policies here. But the Conservatives did introduce in the 1990s work experience programmes, national work experience programmes. And this was um, the, the at the time it was called the Trident programme and the Trident programme consisted of three elements, careers, guidance, work experience and community service. So you would get your bronze, silver or gold Trident award and every student in year 10, sometimes year 11, depending on where the school put it, but it would be in key stage four, would go off and do two weeks work experience. and what we did when I was at school, the school that I went to, we had what was called a careers or job fair day. And the day would start with us um, before the day, we would do what was called the QDOS test. And this was a questionnaire, it was a multiple choice questionnaire that you'd fill in. It would be run through a computer and then they'd come back with a list of careers that you would be suitable for, that perhaps you would be interested in. Now, I'm not sure how accurate this test was, considering every girl in my year got secretary and every boy got a uh, business owner. But this was the 90s. Um, but it did throw up a few careers for people that perhaps they hadn't thought about. I got archivist, um, diplomatic service officer, um, archaeologist, teacher. Um, and they were they were all really interesting careers that I hadn't really thought about for myself at that, that particular time. And then what we did was we had this kind of job centre day where we would go in and all the work experience opportunities would be posted around the room and we would choose three that we wanted to apply for. And then we'd have an interview with our form tutor or another member of staff who would then um, ask us about why we wanted to do it and um things like that before we went and i went and did my work experience in a bank very much said showed me that i didn't want to work in a bank and i didn't want to do admin work um but that was the purpose of it, it was to try and give students the chance to see and experience a working environment to kind of see if maybe that was an industry they were interested in or maybe it's not some people did enjoy it some people didn't but um, the new Labour government um, actually stopped the Trident Work Experience programme because of safety issues around safety and child protection and things like that. The, the requirements needed for students to go on work experience were increased to the point where businesses were saying we can't afford, we can't do this, we can't be involved. Now, that's not to say that work experience doesn't exist. It does. But rather than being a national programme, it is now done individually by schools or individual people. Businesses, industries do offer work experience, mostly post 16. But there are still those opportunities there should people want to engage in them. What New Labour did introduce, though, was a thing called the Personal, personal Learning and Thinking Skills or PELTS. 
And this was really more of a thing for teachers than it was for students. But what it did was it got it, it identified essential skills that it was believed that students needed to develop and to explore throughout their education. So it was things like um, critical thinking and negotiation, teamwork, um, compromise, discussion, debate, things like that. And as teachers, we were asked to um, map these things to our schemes of work to show where we were offering opportunities for those skills to develop. Now, this was never actually rescinded. It just kind of died and nobody really does it anymore. I mean, we still think about those skills when we're planning schemes of work and, and things like that. We think about what we what skills we want you to develop, but we don't map it to the personal learning and thinking skills program. Um, it's no longer required. But at one stage it was. But the idea behind it was to identify those essential skills that are required in the workplace and then try and build them into our schemes of work and our teaching. The coalition government um, took, a, took, took a different step in because the, most of their plans were more to do with um, academic achievement and academics. What they introduced was were new subjects um, and new subjects such as STEM and STEAM. So it is more a rebranding than new subjects. So science, maths, uh, science, technology, engineering and maths or science, technology, engineering, art and maths. Um, they also introduced computer science, but they were looking at what, what skills and what subjects were needed to compete in a global workforce and started to promote those within schools. And you also saw the introduction of programs such as GIST and WISE. So GIST, Girls in Science and Technology, WISE, Women in Science and Engineering, as a way of promoting traditionally masculine subjects and masculine industries to women. And again, we see a rebranding when it came to home economics, which became food and nutrition, trying to make it more gender neutral and introduce and get more boys into um, those sort of subjects. Um, how successful that's been, I'm not sure. I think it's still too early to tell, but they did, did try. They also introduced independent and impartial careers advice. So they, they created guidelines that said that all schools must provide careers guidance. And we obviously have our careers guidance person in school. Um, and but their advice to a student must be impartial, which means if a student comes to them and says, I would like to look into doing this particular career, they can't turn around and go, yeah, that's not for you. You're, you're, you're not that sort of person. You can't do that. Um, they have to support that um, goal or that kind of um, career aspiration. And it needs to be impartial. So it, it can't be like, well, we're from this area. You should really go into this industry. It, it, it's it's about supporting students careers aspirations and providing them with the information necessary for them to make a decision for themselves. Now, the Conservative government hasn't really done much um, explicitly for economic efficiency. You could argue that the um, T levels and the apprenticeships link into um, this economic efficiency and in getting people into, into industry. But for the, the, the main thrust of those um, policies was to do with equality of education. And maybe the economic efficiency there was more of a side benefit. Now, you could argue that that these have been successful, but it's quite early to tell, particularly with the coalition and the conservative government policies to see whether or not we've actually that there's actually been an impact. Um, and it's difficult to say what impact um, these policies have, considering on average, uh, a person will have eight different occupations throughout their lifetime. So with with that sort of 
linking it back to what they've learned in school and the subjects they've done or or the impartial careers advice that they've had that can be difficult to measure as to how impactful that's actually been okay so that was the second part of this lecture on education and social policy so just to re reiterate what you need to do you need to have um, your notes need to cover the four aims what the aims try to what the aims were what they mean and the policies that try to meet those aims and then you need to decide for yourself whether you think that those policies did or did not meet those aims